Let's talk about the most important thing in the world. The most fundamental thing in our lives. The thing we need most. The thing we most enjoy. It is the tool that makes us human. It's the greatest invention of all time, and it actually made us human. It is the power to dismantle and recreate natural objects. The more you understand about those things, the better you know how they're going to behave when you try to transform them. It is also the way we coexist with other beings. Very sort of ancient symbiotic relationship that we've had with microbes before humans even existed. And finally, it is the method of understanding this world. Taste is maybe one of the most fundamental sensory experiences you can have to stay alive and survive in the world. We encounter it three times a day. It is cooking. This is a power invisible to the eye, but it is stronger than anything else. No living organism can avoid this fate. However, we are able to harness this power. And we have coexisted for millions of years. This man is walking into a swarm of bees in order to obtain honey. Honey is the most important thing. We have some of the world's best honey here in Washington. We use blackberry blossom and raspberry blossom honey. But honey is only an ingredient. I kind of cheat by having better honey and in most cases better fruit than, uh, than my competition. Meat is recognized as the world's oldest alcoholic beverage. This old mead is a result of hard work by Mark and the bees. But the real important work is done by something else. Yeast. Yeast exists in a unique way that differs from any other living organism. Sugar is food for yeast, which converts it to carbon dioxide and alcohol. The CO2 gets blown off and the alcohol stays in your beverage. If you get a mead that has some of those fusel alcohols, you have to let it sit for a year, 18 months, or even more, sometimes five or 10 years. Alcohol is actually a very strange substance. When we drink it, our head spins, our ears ring, and our faces turn red. Alcohol is essentially a chemical weapon that yeasts produce to prevent other microbes from taking over its food source. In other words, it can be said that alcohol is a poison created by yeast. But surprisingly, we humans love this type of poison. Sometimes we love it too much and become addicted. How did this happen?
whiskey, every time we have a, a beer or a sip of a cocktail or a glass of wine, and just ask why. Why do we like this so much? Why are we not drinking vinegar or any of the other tens of thousands of kinds of organic compounds? Why do we obsess about them? We obsess about them because the flavors are indicating something about the caloric composition and the microbial origins of the fermentation. In a natural state, there is only one instance where alcohol exists. It is when yeast meets sugar. From its scent and taste, we notice right away that there is sugar in alcohol. Now, you could ask the question then, well, why are yeast doing this? And it turns out that the yeast are producing alcohol to kill off bacterial competitors. It is a strategy that was contrived in order to monopolize all the sugar among all the microbes in rotting fruit. However, in order for this strategy to work, one condition is needed. Yeasts themselves had to develop a high tolerance to alcohol, and so they can create alcohol at levels that no other microbe can stand. However, there is one other being who can tolerate alcohol. Humans. We have DNA that can metabolize alcohol. They evolve the ability to grab it, to eat it, and to metabolize it. They get energetic advantage, and they may also get antimicrobial advantage. Bacteria are killed by alcohol. It may be that our bodies have learned that working with microbes such as yeast gives us a better chance for survival. Almost every place in the world, everybody eats and drinks products of fermentation every day. They might not be aware that they're fermented, they might not be thinking about fermentation, but most people are familiar with products of fermentation even if they know nothing of the process of fermentation. Microbes have voracious appetites. Everything in the natural world becomes their food. They have the ability to break down everything to easily digestible form. And fermentation is a way that cleverly intercepts the ability of these microbes. This is the largest fermentation site in the world. Aspergillus, a type of mold. Aspergillus are not here to work for us. They are only working for their own survival. They break down the protein in beans. And it is us humans that take it away from them. This is the result.
It's easy to know if the beans have been fermented properly. Well-fermented beans give off a strong, pungent smell. As protein breaks down, it becomes amino acid, and in the process creates a strong, savory taste. This is the idea that nutrients are broken down by the bacteria and fungi of fermentation into simpler forms that are frequently easier for our bodies to absorb. This is the very reason why we ferment beans. Sauces have developed in unique ways, but the principle is the same. What they all have in common is that the protein of the soybean is broken down by the fermentation into amino acids. The amino acids are much more accessible to us, and the amino acids also give the soybeans, you know, just much more, you know, interesting, exciting, compelling flavors. And there's basically three ways to break foods down. There's cooking, which is, for our species, relatively new and then there's drying or desiccation. And then there's fermentation. So I think this receptor really has evolved and this taste serves more as an indicator of when foods have been fermented. This is why almost all countries have traditions of fermenting. There is one common ingredient found among them, fish. Fermented fish may be one of the oldest uh, fermented foods that we still eat in pretty much its original form. Pour tour de la Méditerranée, faisait fermenter les poissons pour faire une sauce qu'on appelait le garum ou le garros. Et il y a encore quelques survivances autour de la Méditerranée. En Italie, on trouve la colatura, qui est aussi une sauce de poisson. La storia di questo prodotto chiaramente parte da, da molto lontano. Noi in effetti non abbiamo inventato niente. Diciamo che la nostra colatura di Alice è un po' il discendente nobile del, di questa salsa di pesce che usavano fare già gli antichi romani, che loro chiamavano garum. This sauce can be found in an entirely different place as well. Cho nên là đối với tôi thì nước mắm nó là món quốc hồn quốc túy, nó là cả một cái văn hóa cả một dòng chảy mấy trăm năm của cái dân tộc Việt Nam này. À, đối với tôi nước mắm nó không chỉ và không phải là nước chấm bình thường. vẫn muốn là đưa những cái chất lượng à, tốt nhất của nước mắm truyền thống à, lưu giữ cho đời sau. Thông thường cái tỷ lệ à, ở Phan Thiết này làm từ 300 năm nay đó là tỷ lệ vàng ba cá một muối khi mà ủ chượp cá với lại muối thì nó sẽ à, à, i fattori importanti sono la materia prima e il sale che adoperiamo che è un sale di rape. E poi c'è questo lungo periodo di, di, di fermentazione in botte di castagno. E quy trình của là nước mắm truyền thống, đúng chuẩn truyền thống thì nó sẽ là cái sự ủ chượp giữa cá và muối. Rồi chúng ta cho vào những cái thùng à, bằng gỗ. À, nhưng mà thông thường nó sẽ là từ 12 đến 24, ngay cả đến có thể đến 36 tháng. 
Humans have done all they can. Now it's up to these little guys. Questo liquido rimanendo in botte succede un po' come il vino. Per quanto ci riguarda, più rimane a fermentare in botte, più ne acquisisce in profumo e in dolcezza, praticamente. Thì các nghệ nhân những người làm nước mắm cho chúng tôi là phải thử cái nước. Alla fine di questo processo buchiamo la botte e lasciamo colare il liquido, perciò colatura. After a long wait, a new taste has been created. Italy and Vietnam. Vietnam and Italy. Two countries on opposite sides of the world with two different food cultures. But they both have a sauce made in a similar way. Noi la mettiamo al posto del sale su qualsiasi cosa. À, ví dụ như những món ăn như là, là thổ biến nhất của Việt Nam như là cá kho tổng quốc gia khác ở chỗ là trong máu người Việt Nam mình có một phần nước mắm ở trong đó. Un jolly, io sarei dire che è il jolly degli chef. Could this simply be a coincidence? Or is it a result of the inevitable? What is clear is that the link of fermentation that connects different regions is not just limited to fish sauce. Il y a eu, il y avait dans les époques très anciennes une route, donc la route de la soie qu'on a, enfin une route qu'on a appelée après la route de la soie. Mais en fait, cette route, elle traversait beaucoup de pays aussi où on faisait déjà des fermentations, comme en Asie centrale, euh, les fermentations de, du lait euh, en Mongolie, par exemple. Il y a toutes ces fermentations du lait de jument fermenté. In the fall, when livestock begins to fatten, the nomads of Mongolia become busy. This has to be the most creative way to use milk from livestock. Hommage, au départ, ça, 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 ça s'est sans doute créé par hasard quand on a voulu transporter du lait dans le, une outre faite avec l'estomac d'un animal. Parce que dans l'estomac de l'animal, il y a des enzymes qui vont faire prendre le lait en solide, donc coaguler le lait. Et cette enzyme, on l'appelle la présure. Et c'est ça, aujourd'hui, qu'on qu ajoute dans le fromage, dans le lait, pardon. With yeast, milk coagulates, which creates curds. The nomads use curds to make a variety of dishes.
сах сараа гаргаад гарсан эдгэн хэвэн дорж тэгээд бэст болно. Өнөө өхрийнхаа сүг байр, хөнийнхаа сүг, ямааныхаа сүг аль альны энэ цаа цагаа идэг юм болсруулаад арулаа бодо хатахад бол бас жилийн хэрэгцээ хаан. Арул аалцраан бол арулаа зүсэд ингээд хийж байгаа юм. As more time goes by, more fermentation happens. Justement, il y a encore une grande culture de la de la fermentation du lait en Asie centrale, ce qui se serait ensuite propagé un peu dans les pays, dans l'ère ce qu'on appelle l'ère baltoslave. It was the nomads who first fermented milk to make cheese, but there are a people who took it to the next level. Parmigiano Reggiano è un formaggio unico. Ci vogliono 500 litri di latte per circa 40-45 kg di prodotto, quindi queste caldaie. Noi quando cuociamo il latte arriviamo circa a 55 gradi, quindi se noi pensiamo non è una temperatura elevatissima. Il 100% sarebbe un'altissima temperatura dove tu hai quasi la certezza di decidere tutti i battenti. There is a reason why they are trying so hard to preserve the bacteria in the milk. They kind of set the stage for what's to come in the ripening process. Parmigiano Reggiano deve crescere bene perché lo dobbiamo educare. Come lo educhiamo? Con la giusta temperatura, la giusta umidità, la giusta pulizia. E allora a quel punto lì, se tutto viene fatto bene, siamo sicuri che alla fine sarà un grandissimo prodotto. If we take good care of bacteria, they give us something back in return. Parce que les, il faut dire que les bactéries, elles ont un intérêt à travailler pour nous. On leur donne quand on leur, quand on fait fermenter un aliment, euh, on leur donne le gîte et le couvert. On leur donne à manger. On leur donne un environnement agréable pour elles parce qu'on les met dans un endroit où il fait chaud en général. Et ça, ça s'est passé avant qu'on domestique les animaux, qu'on domestique les, les chèvres ou les vaches ou les chevaux ou les chiens même. <laughs> so it can be said that microbes such as bacteria, yeast and fungi are the first livestock that humans tamed. We have fed them, raised them and used their abilities. He is one of the best chefs in the world and knows this fact very well. Lei non riusciva a capire all'inizio perché non c'erano le ricette con le proporzioni e io spiegavo non puoi avere delle ricette perché il parmigiano è un elemento vivo attraverso un ingrediente forse il primo piatto mai creato con un ingrediente in realtà senza pensarci gli ingredienti erano due Uno è il parmigiano reggiano e l'altro è il tempo. Attraverso queste stagionature siamo riusciti a fare questo piatto che continua ad evolversi nel tempo. Il tempo che trasforma quell'ingrediente in cinque diversi ingredienti. 24, 30, 36, 40 e 50. 
senti la cantilena lenta lenta 24 30 36 questo vuoi rappresentare questo piatto Questo è uno dei piatti più iconici della, della nostra storia. Non è un esercizio tecnico, è un modo di esprimere lo scorrere lento del tempo. When you're cooking food, there's like an immediate reaction between heat And, and, and ingredients that you experience, whereas with fermentation, it's a much more, it's a much slower reaction. So, so fermentation is, is life, right? It's, it's, you're literally waiting for other living organisms to do something that you want them to do. Um, so it's, it's almost like having like, like billions of children that, that, that you're, you're raising and teaching the right way to do things and, and, you're, and you're setting up conditions. A suitable environment for fermentation is not created overnight. Che da generazioni produce prosciutto all'angherano in provincia di Parma. Questi lieviti crescono naturalmente già in fase quando i prosciutti sono ancora nelle stanze frigorifere. sulla superficie del prosciutto e lui mi diceva quando un prosciutto è ben coperto da fiori bianchi che, questo, che non esistono fiori sul prosciutto che questa copertura bianca sono lieviti this yeast did not appear on its own che cosa succede il prosciutto sul lato dove sono i prosciutti più vecchi i prosciutti più vecchi arricchiscono i prosciutti più giovani. Once sufficiently aged, they move on to the next step. Quando il prosciutto ha circa 20 mesi, lo mettiamo in botti da vino. Ma quello che succede è che la cosa interessante è che ci sia questo intrecciarsi di lieviti eh, di prosciutto e di vino crea nel prosciutto una grandissima eleganza. It is the result of microorganisms working together. As new yeast is added, special flavors and scents are created. But they don't always cooperate. In fact, microorganisms are experts at killing each other. Io e i miei fratelli siamo sempre cresciuti nel gorgonzola. This place uses old secrets to protect the taste of cheese. Um, questi aghi all'incirca fanno 100 fori su ogni superficie e tramite questa foratura permettiamo all'ossigeno di entrare e di andare a sviluppare la muffa, penicillium roqueforti, all'interno del formaggio. Le forme lasciate in stagionatura naturalmente si ricoprono di muffa, quella che noi chiamiamo eh, barba, una barba naturale, una barba azzurra, una barba verde scuro. Penicillium roqueforti, o blue mold. The mold on the cheese keeps unwanted germs from reproducing. Il penicillio roqueforti, quindi il penicillo, è una muffa eh, nobile, è una muffa gentile, è una muffa che 
fa bene all'essere umano. The natural antibacterial substance created by blue mold is the antibiotic penicillin that saved many lives. Of course, it also has a pungent smell and a bitter taste. Fermented food also changes the landscape of a country. You can see the scenery every winter. It is the top food of fermentation. Many microorganisms are grouped in one spot. Kimchi is the food that carries the most microorganisms. Because there are many ingredients in kimchi, it creates an ecosystem where various germs can live. Its diversity creates that particular rich and dynamic taste. 소고기 양지를 이렇게 폭 끓여서 국물을 붓는데 한 15일 정도 된 굉장히 맛있어요. 국물도 시원하고 맛있고. We live with microorganisms everywhere. That's why everything can be an ingredient for fermentation. We cannot see it, but microorganisms are active even at this very moment. Microbial activity also creates a whole new flavor. For me, fermentation is a way to access a different flavor profile from an ingredient. And every season we will take an ingredient and we will do completely different fermentations with it. And we'd also like to get a lot of our ingredients from the wild and going out to different places and seeing what's around. I've worked in so many different restaurants who pioneered so many different type of fermenting techniques. These microbes interact and the way that they change things is the, what makes fermentation so fascinating. We'll do a lacto-fermentation, we will smoke it, we will salt it, we will take all different aspects. So we made a garum, which was made from bondegi, or silkworm, uh, which had a really, really good flavor profile. We mixed bee pollen and bondegi, 
and a mixture of salt and nurek. And we ferment that down at 60 degrees for about six to seven weeks. Just the duck, because what we were trying to highlight there is a very, the integrity of the meat and then the way that the fermentation complements it. Fermentation is different from other cooking methods. It takes a long time and it also stinks. A dark and humid basement is also needed. Non veniva più nessuno. Abbandonati per tanto tempo. This constant humid place is an unwelcome environment. E quindi siamo stati fortunati, siamo stati a... dove stagiona questo prodotto incredibile che è il culatello di Zibel. To make culatello, you need a pig's hind legs and bladder. Prendiamo, quindi abbiamo detto, lo massaggiamo con vino e aglio, poi lo saliamo, sale e pepe, lo lasciamo 4 o 5 giorni e poi dopo lo prendiamo. Lo mettiamo nella vescica, lo leghiamo e qui è un processo incredibile. È come fare una rete, è come vedere un ragno quando fa la sua rete. Now the most important process begins. Dove le cantine sono ancora intatte e da 700 anni stagionano, diciamo, culatelli. avremmo acquistato in un sapore così buono, così importante, un profumo così inebriante che ci stupirà. A humid environment where fungi are prone to multiply creates a new flavor. The making process is not the only unique thing about fermented food. So cheese, which is very common, is which is rotted milk. In Europe and the United States and North America, um, is found disgusting by many people in Asia. And for example, 
uh, fermented fish sauce, which is a common flavoring in Southeast Asia, is found disgusting by Americans. It smells of the cage. Most cultures do something to ferment food or, or let it decay in some way if they don't ferment it. And often the, what they do is found disgusting by other cultures. Let's find out. We're going to do a simple experiment. Participants of different races and nationalities will experience fermented foods. How will they react? Is it okay? I feel like it has gone bad. <coughs> Working out clothes that, had, that has been in one month flying, you know. <laughs> I think I'm gonna fall. I'm going to this. One, two. Do people actually eat this? People have this? Like, like, enjoy this? Wow. But there are different reactions to similar foods. Maybe Feels like being home again. Some say it's delicious, and others say it's disgusting, fermented and rotten, delicious and disgusting. Where is the boundary? La différence entre fermentation et pourri, en fait, elle est très très petite, très étroite. Elle dépend de la culture de la personne qui va manger l'aliment. Parce qu'il y a une chose qui peut être pour moi fermentée et qui sera pourrie pour vous, et au contraire, la, la même chose. Scientifically, decomposition and fermentation are similar. Both are results of microbial activity. However, accepting the result is different for each person. What's disgusting in other cultures, each culture depends on the culture. So, why do we have this response, you might ask? First of all, it is a way to communicate to other people that they shouldn't eat something. Disgust may be hooked into the avoidance of pathogens, the avoidance of micro, uh, harmful microorganisms. Perhaps we adopted the feeling of disgust to avoid decomposed food. What's more interesting is that this feeling doesn't just apply to food. As culture evolves, it, since it's such a negative avoidance response, take, get me away from this, it becomes used, it becomes attached to other things. It is the feeling of disgust. And that unfortunately expresses itself sometimes in reactions to strangers or ethnicities other than your own. So it's not just when we see something dirty, but also strangers. 
minorities, foreigners, and unfamiliar food. The source of disgust that we feel toward unfamiliar things stems from a defense mechanism to avoid bacterial infections. What shouldn't be forgotten is that disgust was created by us. Because disgust is acquired, and it's, so it, doesn't, it isn't part of our genes, as far as we know. Therefore, we have the ability to hate something and like something. If human beings are one thing, we are adaptable. I'm always challenging people if they, you know, if they tell me like, like, oh, I hate fermented foods, or I hate kimchi, ooh, I hate uh, blue cheese. You know, I'm just always encouraging them like, give it another try. You know, I mean, that, that, that's, that's how we learn. What does it mean to eat a food that someone else considers disgusting? Now, how do we overcome the disgust, as we do in many cases, and if each culture overcomes some disgust? And that seems to be primarily by exposure. And I think that it's very interesting to think that our species evolved a basis for detecting fermentation. And it turns out that they're good at transforming ingredients of all kinds into materials that are more flavorful, easier to digest, um, just all kinds of advantages. Long, long ago, human beings learned how to take advantage of their powers. So fermentation is basically a symbiotic relationship that humans have with microbes. We've sort of co-evolved. We do not live alone. We are always living with others. In that process, we borrowed the power of completely different entities. And we were able to do what was impossible and make great food. It was the process of overcoming the fear and unfamiliarity the ability to coexist together made us who we are now. This has cleverly led us to survival. Enjoying delicious food. Avoiding deadly poison. It's all thanks to this ability. A whole new world has unfolded upon us since we adopted this ability. It is taste. We are entities that can taste.